So tonight, uh, the R talks are going to talk, um, are, are delighted, first of all, to welcome you all in our uh, this evening. We will be talking about what uh, art digitalization um, do, do, do you speak? So in this, uh, in, in, um, uh, we, last week we discussed how it all started uh, in the art history of digitalization. So blockchain, uh, NFTs, metaverse. And tonight we are going to see um, the, how artists do leave digitalization. We have contradictory uh, feelings uh, been em emerge through, you know, through all our talks and regarding the free digital world. Some artists embrace it, some artists uh, uh, are lost in translation. So, sorry about the, <laughs> the finger. So tonight we are, um, we are having wonderful speakers. We're uh, going to have uh, Rob Holu. Good evening. Uh, we are having, um, Big Comic Art, Kirsten Hinder, uh, Maria uh, Gracia de Pedro, Richard Moran, and of course, Lisa Russell. Good evening, everyone. So we are uh, going to be uh, speaking uh, with Rob Holub uh, that is in between, uh, is connecting while he's working. And he's a moderator, a speaker, and film producer, and TV producer also. Rob, good evening, how are you? I'm very stressed because I have to connect through the digital world again. <laughs> okay. I, I would much more prefer us to be sitting here at the Lake of Zurich, you know, maybe have a beer or a, a tea and just talk around the fire. No, but I'm, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. I'm in between <laughs> some projects, but I'm happy that I could join in for these 10 minutes. And I'm sorry if I have to leave afterwards. Um, and yeah, I mean, talking about uh, digitalization, how we're living or how I am experiencing my digital life as an artist. Um, so yeah, it's no coincidence. I'm, I'm connected to you uh, via the virtual ether, which is great, right? Um, and I go back with my art, so to speak. I mean, I'm not a painter, I'm a, I'm a musician, or I express my emotions, let's put it that way. If art is a way to express emotions or ideas, then I do it through music, through songs, songwriting, singing. And lately I've been uh, also working on my first feature documentary film called Searching for Contact. Uh, my background is in the media world, media communication. I've been working in TV production for more than 20 years, and I've studied journalism media. So communication was always the key and the core of how to transport a message in my case. Again, I'm a very bad painter, but I think I'm a fairly good communicator, and I just love to connect that way. I'm just, yes. I'm just getting a call. I'm just getting a call here, so I will uh, yes, end the, that call, and I hope... We lost you for... A second. So Richard, um, Rob, um, he, um, we, we connected to a dear friend, uh, Priscilla Shell, who hopefully she will be here soon, and, and uh, about a documentary, Searching for Contact. So Rob uh, sh is, will share his journey of reconnecting, here he is again, um, through reconnecting uh, and keeping human connection alive, as, as he says. Rob, can you hear us again? <laughs> okay, so this was this was all staged, right? I had a friend calling me in to show you how disconnected we are because it doesn't always work. If we were sitting around the fire, this wouldn't have happened. Actually, I'm sorry, but somebody did call me. So uh, go, you hear me, right? You hear me, you see. Me. Yes, yes. So, I was so, I was just saying, Rob, what inspired you to you know to to organ to create this documentary that you are still actually yeah on process searching for contact exactly i mean the the question is what is the documentary about and it's about uh, my entry question into doing 300 plus interviews around the world um, as a filmmaker was how does social media affect us on a human level and that's a very broad question but eventually i was interested coming from a personal point of view of struggling with social media struggling with my smartphone being online constantly and the industry asking me for followers and this is how I get measured. So this constant questioning, the who am I in this digital world that is becoming so more digital driven and, and measured, I've embarked on a journey to question who are we in the digital world? And that's a very philosophical question to ask. So the, the, the answers were just as bro you know, broad and fluid and, and 
didn't always make sense to me, but I, I think searching for contact wants to, wants to present a, a journey, a personal or is presenting a personal journey, which is mine, of a human being that is struggling with his identity because our identities get scattered in a way through social media. Like, how is it even possible to be authentic, right? If you are taking pictures of you that are staged and videos of you that you want to have more likes because you know they will get more likes, so you are kind of staging them. So again, this question of identity, personal identity in the digital world is something that has driven me as an artist coming from a you know, point of view as a musician. Um, and, and this really has affected me not only artistically, but personally as well. I, I had a like, you could say it was, I was close to burning out, but I had some stress related issues. I'm not blaming social media for that, but I guess I'm blaming myself for it and not having found the right access to using these tools in a healthy way. So I think mental, mental health and, and finding that balance for your own sanity is a, is a big topic in my film, right? What do you create? How do you create it? And for who to create it? And what result do you expect to get in order to be happy? Or, or like, what's the, what's the motivation behind it? Because I think it's very easy to get lost, mm -hmm. to get lost in this world of likes and comments and hates and jealousy and all these things that this social mirror is creating, right? On the flip side, it's an opportunity to be creative. Like I've shot more than half of my documentary on my smartphone without having to hire a camera team because the technology allows me to do so. So that's, that's it's, it's like, maybe I should call the film a double-edged sword, you know, because in the beginning I was very critical of social media and then I understood, oh, it's just a tool. So what's wrong with me? <laughs> what's, what's inside of me? How do I reconnect to what mm -hmm. I want and what is good for me. So it, it, there's a very a deeper philosophical aspect in the film that I wanted to highlight, but I'm obviously not sharing any, I, I didn't have, I didn't find the truth. I didn't, I don't have answers, but I'm sharing a vulnerable personal journey that I hope will, a lot of people can relate to because eventually I think we all want the same things in life, which is to be seen, to be heard, to be recognized and loved, right? So, yeah. So, yeah. Since, Karina, if I may, since we only have very limited time with Rob. Yes. Uh, so you talk about social media and, and I very much agree with what you're saying in terms of how we film things, how we photograph, how we present ourselves. And then you mentioned that you, you've been able to shoot most of your documentaries with your smartphone. Um, but the smartphone as such is just a technological advance that allows you to use your camera a lot more easily than mm -hmm. a video camera a while back but when you say that it has allowed you facilitated for you to make those documentaries what is the correlation with social media well the correlation of social media like what well one thing is what the film is about and the other thing is almost the the how i created this piece of art which in this film in this case is a film right um the, the question then also becomes of how we format film these days, because TikTok is a good example, right? I mean, I'm going for a 90 minute feature length documentary. I'm not sure whether I'm asking a question, but people are on TikTok, young people are on TikTok. Like they want snappy snack TV chunks of film and video. So if, if, if you ask me how maybe affected how did the fact that I used my smartphone affect my film making process? Then I realized that maybe I should do a series. Maybe I should change the format. Maybe what I'm doing is not appropriate anymore in this very fast driven world where attention spam is getting shorter and shorter. And in regards to social media, I could have just shared and document almost on a meta level constantly what I was doing. But then I would get so distracted, so it would distract me from my filmmaking process. So I think this, again, it goes into this area of being lost. Like there's so much you can do that you can get overwhelmed to an extent where you lose track of what you're actually creating. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but these are just some reflections on what you said. No, no, no. So basically I was trying to make sure that, the, 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 that there was a correlation between 
the smartphone as a camera, as a tool, yeah. and how you actually use that tool. Um, so what you're saying really is that it kind of, you, you didn't just use it as a tool, you also adapted the tool to a new way of communicating in much smaller bites um, and to make it more palpable and more um, visible. Yes, and I think the, 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 the struggle comes also from the fact that right now our smartphone we have everything in this smartphone and more and more the, the smartphone is representing so much because it used to be making phone calls then it becomes sending texts and pictures and videos and now it's a, a great photo camera it's a great video it's a i'm doing e-banking on it so i think again this potential addiction or disconnection because i'm so attached to this device that is ruling my life comes from the fact that it it entails half of my life by now that and i i'm i'm wondering you know like in 10 years from now we might have a chip chip implanted somewhere and i will use a camera just as a camera or maybe i will i will film actually through my eye i don't know so the the advancement of technology is certainly an aspect also that is maybe sometimes conflicting with how we are perceiving you know our art uh, so in this case it it could also be a distracting thing because my, you know, just like before I was on a call with you and somebody called me through the same device. So I got disconnected. So it's just a question maybe back to, to ask ourselves if the smartphone is the best camera I have right now in my pocket, what mm -hmm. will it be in 10 years? And how is that going to affect my creation as a, as a filmmaker? Because remember 50 years ago, I would have had, I would have to have 10 people in order to create or five or three people to create film or five people right now i can do it on my own so that's a, a also a, a different uh, a big difference maybe but i think what's also very important what you're saying beyond social media you mentioned e-banking um and all these other um mm -hmm. that so I, I think there is a true effort to force us to force our lives um into smartphones right um, because it is easier to track us to do everything via the smartphone. And the more mm -hmm. convenient you make it, the better it is. But it's not going beyond convenience to being forceful, where you actually, actually can only do certain things via your phone, uh, whether it's you know an iPhone or Google or whatever it might be. It's actually incredible to see how we're being forced more and more into digitization um, and how it's actually enslaving us and I think mm. at this point in the past, where if you don't have the phone, you're lost. I had to go to an interview last week in Luxembourg, and it was in the very north of Luxembourg, which I don't know very well. Um, and I didn't have service. And I was lost. Like I was driving. I had to stop two or three times um, to at the gas station to ask people if I was going in the right direction. Um, it's, yeah, no, it's so a good it's point. Weird. It's a good point, and I think I was I was asking the question myself throughout this journey of let's say five maybe the journey even goes back to ten to thirteen years when I started questioning, you know, these things that we were discussing right now. And I think one question was, do I have a choice? And I think if you ask me now, and people are always saying, yeah, of course you have a choice. Just put a, put away your phone. Well, but actually, I don't. I don't have a choice. That is correct. I would agree with. <laughs> And so let me add one more layer, uh, because I was reading an article last week about an interview that uh, Mark Zuckerberg did about the, um, the, the thing he does every night with his daughters to put them to bed, where he asked them, what is the most important things in life and all about these values? And I'm like, but hang on, how do you reconcile knowing that your platform causes so much damage to young girls, right? And yet here you are, you're married, you have two daughters and you and your wife have no qualms making billions of dollars on, on the back of other children whilst trying to teach your children completely different values. How do you reconcile these two concepts in any way, shape or form, right? Mm. And then it kind of brought the next level because we've been having a lot of conversation with Carolina with people who really feel and we can't deny this right you look at the war in the ukraine right now and how it is for all intents and purposes a social media war right uh, mm. from used how information is translated how heads of state 
uh, using social media. I mean, I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted when I see this. I think this was inconceivable even five years ago, right? Um, where there was literally was a separation between state and citizens. Yeah. Now it's just gotten completely democratized yeah. Yeah. to the point that, in my opinion, is unacceptable, right? I yeah. don't want to hear about certain things um, over social media. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but imagine the impact. I mean, at this point, let's be honest. Mark Zuckerberg has made enough money to make sure that him, his daughters, and probably 30 to 40 generations after them never have to worry about anything in their life. How powerful would it be if that person all of a sudden turned around and said, you know what? I'm going to flip this around. I have children. I want to create a better world for children. So I'm going to flip around my platform and put it to the service of good. And now I'm going to make sure that it serves positive outcomes. That would be incredible. You would instantly have hundreds of millions of people being exposed to the positive versus the negative. How cool would that be? Yeah, but I mean, I, I'm not sure we can just generally say social media or Facebook or these, these big giants, tech giants are necessarily bad or worsening the, 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 the life of kids. I don't have kids. And I read studies about that. And um, you know, just recently I found a study how um do you still hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Somebody's calling me, but I'm not gonna touch any button. So it's just recently I found a study that was saying, oh, actually, it's not that bad for teenagers, you know, social media is not that bad. So I'm also a little bit biased by now. I think the the big the big challenge, and maybe I'm gonna end up with these words here is to empower ourselves um, back, right? I think we are giving away the power through using these technologies that are driven by algorithms to understand how we function in order to feed us what we want, but actually it's not necessarily what is good for us. So to take back that power, this self-empowerment, I think is very important to create awareness, reflect, on who you are, which is not always easy, but then not give yourself up fully to technology. And I think we are at the stage where it's kind of a, it's very blended, you know, our, the reality is blended into the virtual reality. So, you know, I used to say there's this physical reality and the digital reality, and now it's kind of already, you know, shaping into this one blend of realities. But the moment I feel like I lose that control over do I want this? Is this good for me? That's the moment where I want to be like, let's step back and say, okay, this is, I'm Rob. And this is just because Mark is saying this is good. This is not good for me. So I think to take back that control of how you're using technology will be the, the breaking point in the future, rather than just, you know, giving yourself, giving you in <laughs> and yeah, being used for it. So thank you very much, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, yeah. Francis. And actually, thank you so no, much. No, thank you to you because it's it's a quite you know we we could be here for, forever to talk about uh, you know this uh, this uh, searching for content. But now we're going to to the metaverse with becoming art. Good evening, uh, becoming art. Can you hear us? So becoming art was. Uh, uh, was born, as he says, uniquely in the metaverse. And uh, it was one of the first handful of Web3 artists that I would love for Big Comic Art to explain. And, um, and he was with us in our first uh, panels on Clubhouse regarding NFTs, when at that time I, I didn't know anything about NFTs. Big Comic Art, could you tell us more? You have to unmute yourself. If you are there, I can see your eyes. So uh, Becoming Art is from, you know, with us from America. Um, I Hi, hope... Carolina. Hello, hello. <laughs> How are I'm you? Sorry about that. You Good, were in the uh, I... You came back. You came back from the metaverse. <laughs> yes. yes, I'm here. Uh, so yes. wonderful to, to uh, chat with you. Uh, today and yes, uh, it, I believe it's been uh, exactly one year uh, since we since we spoken last. So, uh, yes, a lot of things have been happening this this year. Incredible, have, have incredible. Yes, found ourselves in sort of a a uh, a mess in the world. Yes, um, 
more and more. And we thought we almost uh, got out of one um, war, COVID, which still we haven't, but uh, and now yet we are in a different in a different uh, situation, unfortunately. But uh, becoming art, could you tell us a bit what inspired you to you know to 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 be in the metaverse, as you say, and also to explain us a bit more uh, the Web three artist. Uh, yes, uh, so I guess we're, uh, it was interesting, we were talking earlier a little bit about uh, uh, a social media war, right? So we have, uh, we see that now that things that are happening in the world where uh, we have authoritarian governments uh, using social media against, against us, basically. So, you know what, we know that the uh, the Kremlin has always been a prop propaganda machine, and um, uh, with uh, this new economy that we've been able to create uh, with Web3, uh, we have a situation where um, our ideas have value. So the time that we spend um, uh, digitally, I mean, we're always doing work, and the computer is just another tool. Um, and and for me, I found out as, as coming from a being a traditional painter uh, that uh, you know social media digitally it was a way to to have an audience and share art uh, you know with the world. Uh, so uh, in a way, I, I felt that uh, you know spreading a good message uh, was important when you have uh, people uh, like you know, Mark Zuckerberg uh, and, and Facebook and allowing uh, these, to, uh, these uh, poor messages to be spread across uh, social media. So I felt that, well, if I can somehow, um, you know, jump into that and try to counter that message, because it was, I felt that that was needed, like more good and wholesome content was needed. Uh, I grew up, uh, as a kid uh, on comic books. And I felt that, uh, you know, we can have a different way to, to, to um, organize this, to showcase this work uh, today. So, but using this new technology, you know, obviously we're all connected uh, across the world now uh, with these uh, smart devices. Uh, so it, it kind of helps us share this art uh, in that manner. Yes, yes, but uh, becoming art, you also, uh, you know, um, aside from, uh, you know, I think the social medias and digitalization helped um, also promoting, you know, any artist who found themselves without a gallery or looking for a gallery because, you know, we, we are already now into a different, uh, you know, um, after pandemic, but, um, what what is uh, the uh, you were one of the first though because when we first with Francois we had the clubhouse you know the panel was on NFTs Donalyn Patakos introduced us and mm -hmm. uh, so for you 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 think it's it's uh, extremely important to be in in this world um, in the digital. Uh, yeah. I, I believe I believe so. Yes, it's uh, oh, it's 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 a it's a new it's a new economy. So there there is an incentive, and and there's an incentive for human beings to connect and work together. Um, so I believe, uh, and and you can see now. I mean, a year ago we didn't know what NFTs were, and now. Uh, you see now you have the Ukrainian government creating their own NFTs um, to counter, to raise funding uh, for their military to counter uh, Putin. So you see this dynamic uh, interchange where the entire world can come together very simply and help uh, these individuals um, in this uh, lone country uh without any uh third party so each individual uh, can sit down you know with a phone and support uh, uh 
uh, a good cause. Um, so I, I think that, that that's pretty powerful. So then, then it comes down to uh, what kind of information are you disseminating um, through your, your phone? You know, we, we, uh, you know, we're talking about, well, we're, we're stuck in, uh, you know, we're stuck with our phone. I, I, I heard um, Elon Musk uh, speak about, um, you know, the cell phone as, as sort of like a, uh, your Android self, you know, your, yourself in the metaphor. So, you know, what you're, you're doing digitally um, is also a part of you. Um, so it, it, and because at first I was sort of against social media myself, I'm like, what, what is this stuff? <laughs> uh, so, and, and, and in retrospect, that's also uh, kind of what my art is about too, is using social media uh, against itself, is using uh, Mark Zuckerberg's tricks against himself and, and being able to come in like a Trojan horse and take away from his, uh, you know, marketplace because well, Facebook isn't isn't paying me anything uh, to post. Uh, so, but by spreading a, a good message, other people can um, come in and and create this uh, new economy based on uh, good messages or good art. Uh, so, uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. I think, you know, uh, let's say you, you're seeing uh, digitization as a way of, you know, uh, of expressing freedom of thoughts and through and, and connecting to the entire um, world. I think that's the main thing why we are all here uh, tonight, I think. But uh, a big comic, would you like to share any anything with us tonight before we, we go forward with our other panelists? Because we are many today. We have Amazing, amazing people coming up. Would you like uh, you you could you could would you be able to do it from your phone? Uh, yes. So I've been uh, putting together. Uh, I'll show you my my recent work, um, yes. where I was putting together also some uh, trying to raise some funds for Ukraine, uh, mm -hmm. which we had on our post. Yes. Yes, so it's actually, I'll show you the traditional painting. So I approached it as a traditional uh, portrait, portrait of painting, um, but just um, coming into uh, how I can use, utilize this physical uh, painting also and connecting that with the digital um, metaverse. So, um, you know, we, we come back to our humanity uh, through, uh, traditional oil painting, but being able to use uh, social media uh, to spread that good message. Uh, so this, uh, I have a website set up, uh, bigcomicart.com, and you can go in there, and if you feel free uh, to uh, a bid on this artwork, and 100% of the proceeds uh, go to uh, uh, supporting the Ukraine Red Cross. Thank you. That is is a uh, wonderful, wonderful becoming art. I think that's uh, you know I was speaking to some Ukrainian artists today, and uh, that's what you know. This is how we can help uh, today is to to not what's happening. We can't we can't stop unfortunately this war, but how we can uh, help all the artists and all the art and to to find new ways um, to live this, uh, this, uh, this terrible, tragic moment. Thank you. Thank you, Becoming Art. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I hope uh, you know, we will go back to some questions later. I will go now to, um, uh, to Kirsten Hinder. Hello, Kirsten. How are you? Good evening. There we go. Oh, oops. So uh, I'm good, thank you. Nice to see you and nice to be here. Thank you for joining us. So you are in, in, uh, in Sweden now, Kirsten. Yes, that's and, right. And uh, for me, it was very important, you know, that you join us tonight. So you could help um, artists, wherever they are in the art world, to understand a bit how, you know, how to help them. 
because you, you are creating an extraordinary inspiring project called Infinity Mark, uh, which is based uh, on bridging the analog and digital art worlds with NFT and blockchain and technologies. Could you tell us a bit more? Because you know there is a lot uh, behind the scenes. Yeah, I know. And it's, I keep telling artists and gallerists and anybody in the space that it is like a general um, lack of understanding because we're also overwhelmed with all of the new technologies and what possibilities they bring. And I think there is so much positive to be harvested here, but I think um, it's a communication issue and it's um, difficult for artists clearly to navigate uh, the new technologies, especially when they're coming from the analog space. So what we are really passionate about is specifically finding ways for artists who are working with a practice that is primarily analog to help them find ways to position their work for the future. So to give them the tools and the understanding of how these new technologies can benefit their analog practice so that they don't feel like I'm missing this wave or I need to reinvent themselves. I've had so many artists tell me that, you know, I used to work with programming and now I'm an artist and now I feel like I have to become a programmer again and become a digital artist because they haven't understood the difference between creating digital art as NFTs, which is obviously really blossomed in the past uh, couple of years and, and been highly um, um, you know, in the media. And there's so much interest around digital works that are NFTs. And there's a whole speculative in terms of au the auction space. And I can understand that everyone just wants to get in there. But what we're trying to do is help people to understand, okay, this is a technology. It's a means to an end, not an end in itself necessarily. And if you choose to create within the digital space, that's one choice you can make. You can choose to straddle the analog and the digital space. Or if you have an analog practice, you can harvest the best of these technologies and find ways of sustaining your analog practice so that um, it creates a more robust practice. It helps you sort of navigate into the digital future that we know we're all heading to without having to reinvent your practice and leave your painting or sculpting or whatever it is you're doing uh, to create in a different way. And so we're doing that with a couple of different uh, means, which are two products that are a way of sort of giving the physical works a digital identity. And that has the purpose of both securing the provenance and authorship and ownership of the work. And it also adds a layer that gives a physical piece, sort of a currency in the digital future we know we're heading towards. So the piece is still an analog piece, but by certifying it and giving it a digital identity, it sort of ends up in the same playing field as digital works. And, you know, I don't have a crystal ball to know which or how many metaverses we might have in the future, but it's clear that the world is becoming more digitized and it's only a natural upgrade of the art world, in my opinion, that we should start thinking about, okay, you know, even though we've been doing things the same ways for several hundred years, maybe it's time to, you know, take a step forward and package the information that is so important to analog artworks, which is the provenance for the sake of the artists, for the sake of the collectors, to know that, you know, this is not something that, um, yeah, I think it's very easy that people have become so commercial about buying um, and circulating physical artworks that we've forgotten that a lot of the value of the work is in the story behind the work, which is the provenance. And I think it's a collective responsibility we have to ensure that works are properly documented, that artists' authorship is protected, that collectors know what they're investing in, and that we can sustain the analog art world this way and not just look at you know, this analog art world in, being a sort of point in art history where that stops and everything just becomes digitized. You know, Let's find the best ways to merge the analog with the digital because they, both worlds have so much to learn from one another. So it's this hybrid space 
that I think is super interesting. And I see so many artists paralyzed in. So we're just trying to help them navigate um, to do what they want to do and what they love to do. Um, but to just add that extra layer to ensure that they can sustain their practice and, and, um, and also benefit from the new technologies without feeling so overwhelmed. But Kirsten, could you give us a bit, sorry, again, by, by my finger. So could you tell us a, a bit more? It's about paint. Because you see, for me, it's what is very special, what you do. It's something that I never heard before. And I've been, as I told you at the beginning with the blockchain in this right. app. Uh, so for me, this is very, very important for all the artists to, to understand how, how they can do it. Okay, so we have um, two products which we use to tag physical works. One mm -hmm. is like a digital signature that is something that gets applied uh, to a physical artwork. Um, that is quite accessible, um, both in terms of its usability and its price point, that basically what we hope to inspire is that artists, before their work leaves their studio, they mm -hmm. add this layer of protecting the authorship of their work, and when the work goes out into the wild, that this identity follows the work, and because it gets registered on blockchain, uh, it means that uh, you have a way of sort of tracing the lifetime of the work and the information pertaining to the work has been securely registered so that the artist knows that um, if there's any question of their work being falsified or misattributed in the future, that this record has been made. It gives artists the possibility also to see where their work, not specifically with whom, but how their work spreads throughout the world, because it's very difficult for a lot of artists to know that there's such a disconnect. Their work gets sold at a gallery and gets circulated to collectors whom they never meet. And it could be on the other side of the world and they don't have any understanding of where it is. So it gives them sort of a broad overview of their practice and where their work is disseminated. So that's the simpler uh, product. The other product has basically the same function, but uh, it is more like a uh, paste where the uh, it has a chemically engineered um it carries a serial number in the in the the paste um, and that is a way of really integrating this digital identity into the work in a way that hasn't really been done before so um you know if there's a real question of um uh, possible forgery or really needing to um, do a, a um, you know, instead of doing a forensic check of the work, which can damage the work or having to ship the work across the world to have experts look at it and, and determine whether it's um, authentic or not. This is a way of being able to just do like a little quick spot check of the authenticity of a work and uh, without having to remove it or ship it, uh, which has an environmental impact. And, and also the information regarding the work is secured on the blockchain in both cases. So it's basically two products with a similar function, but um, in term, one is more complex and more expensive. So we're trying to be able to cover the whole market so that artists at any stage of their career have the possibility to, you know, sleep well at night, knowing that the works that leave their, um, their atelier um, and go out into the world are properly uh, identifiable and secured. And I think, you know, as we talked about earlier, I think it's really a collective responsibility that's fallen by the wayside. I don't really know where that happened, but, you know, it's, it is so common that you hear of people who have just acquired, you know, an expensive work and, and really got no documentation with it. It's so strange to me that people wouldn't buy a car uh, without any documentation or uh, many other things, you know, where we want to know what it is we're buying and owning. And that's only out of respect for the artist and the work, but also in terms of protecting our investment and, and maintaining this sort of record in art history that, you know, going forward, how will we understand what it is we have in this collective cultural um, uh, pool that, that everyone, you know, benefits from and enjoys in, every, in our everyday lives. So without 
properly documenting things. It's, it's like, I think it's quite irresponsible and we're all to blame, you know, collectors should not buy works that are not properly verified and documented and galleries should not sell works that are not properly verified and documented and artists should not let them leave their studios before that step. So it's like, you know, if we all just take that responsibility and, and ensure that our works are properly documented and that we prioritize, um, you know, this um, taking care of provenance. And we have these technological tools, you know, as Rob said, like the uh, technology shouldn't be seen as just a means or an end in themselves, but rather a means to an end. So, uh, you know, these technologies will become what we make of them. It's just like the metaverse discussions that I have. It's like the metaverse or A or several metaverses are not going to just fall down from the sky on us. That's going to be what we decide it is. So let's take the responsibility and create something that is really useful in helping sustain um, this cultural world that we all know and love rather than just saying, oh, well, you know, I didn't bother to do that. Or I just, you know, I, it's, it's like, we've been a little bit lazy about this, I think. So let's just all take the responsibility. And uh, thank you, Kristen, because I think the main, uh, you know, and I know how important is uh, this simplification of digitalization. It, it is extremely important for all of us because we are still, we are already on the metaverse as with becoming art, but we we don't understand fully where we you know how we can use it, uh, and so I think your 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 project is extremely um, inspiring because it's very you know it's it's very simple for an artist to use. That's why I loved this idea when I when we first spoke a couple of yeah. uh, weeks ago. We're so, trying to ground it, right? It has to be a useful tool for artists. And we're really yeah. getting a lot of feedback as we develop things. So the, the products are supported by an app that the information is recorded in from the artist side. And then there's an app for collectors to manage the works that get pushed to them. So, you know, the feedback is also really great in making sure that we create something that is really useful that artists feel like you know, they don't feel paralyzed as they do today, but they feel like empowered. And um, also to use a word that one of the previous speakers used because these technologies can really give us a power and it's not about, it doesn't have to be some big, super dramatic thing in a metaverse either. It can just be that, you know, it makes our everyday lives better and easier. And that does for both the creator because it is a new creator's economy. So let's support that with the tools that actually make that sustainable and not highly speculative and something that is only accessible by some people and not others. You know, this is a shared um, a shared moment where we can benefit from both sides, the analog and the digital and make this amazing space in between um, something really fantastic by learning from each other rather than just deciding that technology is the answer to everything you know if we if we think about how we create things in a really thoughtful meaningful way then yes technology can solve a lot of problems but it's driven by humans and we are the ones who need to uh, curate it and and create it just because somebody creates a platform or a tool or an app um, that is highly technologically advanced doesn't mean that it's valuable right it has to be something that's actually valuable to the users who need it and the need has to be there so that's so important i think these days since things are moving so quickly and um, that we don't just derail and decide that everything that we create that's technologically advanced is great because it's not there's thousands of examples of poorly engineered technology so let's just be thoughtful and and and, and move forward in a sustainable way and not just you know feel like everything has to happen at once because I think there's a real risk there that we're going to miss a lot of important moments along the way. Yes, no, indeed, indeed. Thank you, Kirsten. I think, and please do uh, write uh, your, you know, anything on, on the chat for everybody to. Yes, to I, I'm happy to. It's a lot of, it's a lot to take in. So I'm going to put <laughs> yes. my email in the chat for anybody who wants to give me a thumbs in. Yeah. Thank you, Kirsten. And, and now, you know, we are going to another, uh, to the inspired also Richard Moran, who is 
again, photographer, artist, and uh, futurist, and founder of the Kulu Tracks and CEO of the Kulu Tracks. But also, we were, as Kristen was saying, going from being a photographer and artist, and also embracing this world. So, Richard, good evening. How Hi, are everyone. you? Hi, everyone. Good, good to afternoon. be here, as always, Carolina. Um, I think that, I mean, I've listened to what everyone's saying, and I, rather than go on about where we're going in the future, um, Carolina asked me to share some photos. So I thought I'd share some photos and maybe a little bit of a story to kind of help people realize the rapidity of what's happening. Um, the, the bit that kind of rings most to me of watching what's happening currently is going back and remembering what happened when we went from digital, from analog to digital photography? So as a photographer, we've already seen this process once. Um, I started my, my life in photography on cruise ships uh, in the year 2000, way, way back. And then we were still working with operational massive units of film. Um, the first ship I worked on in 2000 was a Disney cruise ship and it had about, what, 2,000 passengers on board. And in a cruise, we were making anywhere between seventy dollars and $90,000 a week on photos. So the volume and the amount of money that was coming in to an artistic form on ships, and I think we also have to think of photography as, as both an art and a utility. Um, it, it's not just for artists, it's also for professionals who are creating work, like a, like a, a welder creates work or, or any professional service creates work as well as being an art. So I think it's a very strange one to have gone through that process already. But I remember like the first time I got on a ship, we were selling a digital camera with 1.2 megapixels. That was the first digital camera we were selling was a Nikon in 2000. Nothing on the ship was actually for the, for the work side was digital. Everything was still analog. And um, that's where that all started. So here, let me share my screen and I'll, um, I'll show you some photos from these kind of times. So this was the Tahitian princess and I am here in Nyalesund, which is in Spitsbergen inside of the Arctic Circle. And you can see there's actually two glaciers in the back of this photo. That's a glacier there. And there's another glacial passage coming there. And then there's actually another one behind the ship. There were three glaciers there. And what happened? This was Midsummer's Day in, in Nihilasund. And we're sailing at about 11 o'clock at night. And what I did here is you can see the little door on the side of the ship there. They lowered the fast rescue boat from there down onto there, got in the boat, and we kind of did some laps around the ship as we were taking photos. Um, this again, same kind of thing, but we were in Australia uh, on the Dawn Princess. This is another one of the ships that first went digital um, in Panama, crossing between one of the major cuts there. Uh, this is interesting because this is actually one of the first contracts that was digital. This was taken on one of the first professional digital cameras that we had on board the cruise ships. So kind of a fun one with that. That was taken on a Nikon D1 back in 2003, 2004, when digital had just been introduced to, to ships. So what we had to do is we had to take all the analog gear off, bring on the digital printers, and then transition all the staff to then work with analog. And then from one day on the turnaround day to the next, we went from digital to analog. On the smaller ships, it was easy. Um, there was only one machine and so on. But when we started on the big ships, I mean, this ship here only had about 600 passengers. On the big ships that I was working on, we had over 5,000 passengers. So the amount of digital work and the amount that going from analog to digital changed cruise ships and changed the way we worked on cruise ships and the profits we made and the services we sold changed dramatically over the years. I mean, I remember in the beginning, just it was like film. And then in the end of it, maybe five, six years later, all of a sudden, instead, in, instead of selling prints, we were actually selling digital images and giving the prints away for free. So the whole aspect of how photography worked as a profession changed because of this digitization. 
And not just that, but I mean, all these images are single shot images. So exactly what you would see from a camera. I mean, this one's really fun. This is Pitcan Island. That's the day I spent on Pitcan Island, which is um, one of the remote, the most remote inhabited island on the planet, halfway through the Pacific, Island, Pacific Ocean. But yeah, again, Kwakatoq, all digital work. And this was in Indonesia. But I mean, that was all just a simple transition of, of photography. But now let's look at what happened when digital came in and it allowed us to do different things with the camera. Now, one of the things that allowed was for a greater range of color to be captured in different formats if you know how to use the camera. So again, with a bit of extra knowledge, you could take a digital camera and produce work that you could never do with an analog camera. There's no way you could actually create any of these photos that we're looking at now with an analog camera. You couldn't. The, the technology of having digital assets and, and digital manipulation and digital ways to work with photos changed the industry. I mean, literally, you could not take these with a film camera. None of these images could be taken with film. The other things that have not come in is, is fun things like, look what we can now do with time lapse to move into something that I'm doing with one of my other current NFT projects. I mean, again, this couldn't be done with old cameras, but now with digital cameras, look at the beautiful work and change in photography that we can do just because of the advent of digital. Let me stop that there. So I mean, just to kind of think back of the fact that we've been through this before. We know the inevitability that as artists get given more tools to use, they automatically start expanding and pushing boundaries. So I love what Christine, what, what you're doing, the, the being able to help people who are thinking analog to move over into the digital is one of the most helpful things that anyone can ever do because there is no way that this doesn't get deeper. There is no way that the digitization effect that we see from here doesn't grow. We all know the inevitability of it because we've seen it with photography, we've seen it with music. So now watching it happen again with how images are sold and how artists are treated and how artists are actually able to monetize and protect their own work, that's the new technology, not the actual digitization, because digitization has been happening for years. As I said, right, first, that first set of digital photos, that was taken in 2003. So the digitization of art is not new. We're catching up now because people have realized that the creation of digital art actually is now sellable to an audience that is now more educated than it has been before. So I think that it's fun to talk about where we've been on this process, because the history of what we've seen is going to dictate what happens as we go forward. Mm -hmm. You mean, I don't see us being able to drop out of NFTs. I, I think the inevitability of the forward motion that we're in, in the digitation, digitization process of art is allowing for the artist to finally be recognized as an individual. And I say that because as, as, a, as a manager of artists on cruise ships, none of my artists were recognized as individuals. They were part of the team that created the art that was on the wall. Okay, there were portraits, but they, they, here we're starting to talk what is art, what is, what is function is having a portrait of your family over your mantelpiece, a piece of art or a piece of record. You mean, so, so this photography and art thing is a little bit strange in a lot of ways on this, but I think it's a great leading indicator of what can happen as we go forward, where artists will have the vision to expand it once they understand what is happening. And it is slow. So I think for us as well to, to be patient with the developments is important. I see so many projects come through with, with what I do with the metaverse and so on. So many projects that are like, 
here, we can put up an NFT platform in a week, go. And it's done. And they're thinking about the money that they grab from it. And that seems like, for me, the comparison of photographers or, or people who aren't photographers going here, I have a cell phone. I don't need you as a professional photographer. I mean, I, I cannot tell you the amount of jobs that I have pitched for that the client has turned around and said to me, no, no sorry, we don't need you. Our, our friend has a, a really good digital phone and he's gonna come and take the photos for us. Weddings, weddings. I, I, I cannot even explain to you how much that has affected this industry because everyone has a digital camera now. So everyone thinks they're a, a true artist or a true photographer. So I think what we're seeing a lot in, in NFT platforms and so on at the moment is the sorting out of that, of how do we, I'm sorry, this is going to sound really bad. How do we cull the herd of people who think they know what they're doing, but don't? And how do we get rid of 85% of NFTs on OpenSea being fraudulent? How do we get those things sorted in the digitization process that people start to actually be able to trust the process because the process is inevitable but people's trust in the process is being battered every day with what's in the sensationalized news so i think it's important that projects that are taking the time to learn who are taking the time to evaluate the systems that we're seeing and be a professional actor in this space is important. Um, there's actually one of those projects online here, Metaphora with Oliver, fantastic project, taking the time to make sure they do the research to make sure that the product that they produce is what the market needs. And I think we, the more we can inspire that, the deeper we will be. Because quite frankly, at the moment, projects are a dime a dozen. Platforms are a dime a dozen. But what we need to be able to sort out is how do we take care of the artists? The people who are coming into this digital space who don't know what they're doing, who are coming in and getting abused. I mean, let's say that this has already been happening for years. I mean, I worked in New York for three years. New York is built on the back of broken artists, period. So how do we stop that from happening in this digital? How do we stop and make sure that as we go forward in this inevitable digitalization process, that we support the good actors and we ensure that the regulations that come in, because God, this thing needs to be regulated soon, but that we make sure that the regulations that come into this protect digital artists. Because otherwise, this whole space is going to collapse with the volume of people who misuse the system. And again, I'll point out to the fact that the biggest, most powerful platform in the space has publicly said, that 85% of the work on its platform is fraudulent. So yes, I, and I, I am so bullish and so positive about what can happen with this space and what can be done with this space. But I am also incredibly scared of what artists are gonna get abused and what systems are gonna get put in place that now that we've given artists the availability to run their own and take control of their own lives and their own incomes, what systems are gonna be put in place that hamper that? Excellent, Richard. Um, Carolina needs to take over for a minute, but I wanna come back to you afterwards because I think you just highlighted a whole bigger issue that I wanna go back to. And I'm sorry, I don't wanna take up too much time because I, I can waffle as, as, as no, long no, no. as anyone will let me. So please, if I waffle too long, please. I just got a message from her. I, I, I'm <laughs> stepping in, but I'll be back because what you yes. said is very correct. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. No, it's it's a very, very deep and we're coming back to what you you know you brought us today because I think it's it's a lot to to say. And um, but I have Maria uh, Gracia de, de Pedro. 
that unfortunately has to leave very soon. Thank you, Richard, and we'll come back in a, in a bit. Maria, uh, good evening. How are you? You are from Madrid? In, directly Hi, with yes. Yes, Maria. Hi, Carolina, thank so, you. Thank you to you, Maria, because Maria will give us a bit uh, our, uh, from an ap academic <laughs> point of view. We cannot hear you anymore. Sorry, I had my yeah. Hamlet going crazy. So Maria, yeah. you you have you are um, a co-founder of Yato Projects, director of Badrar El Yundi, and teacher of contemporary art market at URGC. Yes. So could you tell us a bit? You just finished a and, uh, and dissertation on emerging artists and the market. Could you give us some glimpse of what you know? You you you, you your 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 shared views on, on the subject. Yeah, thank you, Carolina. Well, I agree in uh, a lot of comments that uh, the rest of the speakers has been saying, like uh, mainly with uh, Kirsten. Uh, I have a lot of uh, ideas and connections of uh, what she has been speaking as well about the, the art tech no? and uh, how this importance for the artists in order to, to have them uh, somehow with a um, sort of record of what is happening in the artworks in the future. So I have been uh, selling artworks from artists from the last 10 years, more or less. And I realized that at some point, artists lose the record of uh, who is the one that bought an artwork or where is the artwork. Sometimes they forget, they let the artwork in a storage of someone or even in the gallery, a storage of a former gallery. So I think this idea of tracking the artworks is very important. Uh, all my thesis that, uh, as uh, you mentioned, I just finished the PhD two weeks ago. Uh, it was more about the problems emerging artists are facing. And I started the thesis before all this sort of uh, techno, big data, NFT, blockchain, because it was four years ago. But now we like to implement with all of these new, let's call it movements, you no? Know, because I think they are going to stay and they are going to be part of the of the history of arts. So we need to consider this. And I could say that I have artists, they have been working mainly all the time with painting or photographs. And now they are, they told me they want to know more because they don't know what is going on. And here in Spain, we have a couple of uh, artists that nobody knows them. And thanks to the NFT and blockchain, now they are skyrocket, like they, they were unknown. And now they are going in all the press, in all the information. So the other artists that they were already in the press because they were doing physical exhibitions, they want as well to be in, you know, in the first uh, pole position in the art market and Spain is years ahead from America, from, you know, from UK, from other like uh, Northern uh, countries in Europe, but here they have this uh, necessity. So I think Richard shows as well with his photos, you no, know, like digitalization was something that we have already with photography and other techniques since so many years ago but now it's coming in our everyday life. And for me personally, I don't know a lot. I try to read every day because I think every day there are new things. Uh, I try to learn how to mint these NFTs, how to create all this process and to understand the relation in between this digital and now the, the metaverse as well. Like I have artists say, telling to me, I want to have a land. What is a land? I don't know. I want to have my artworks in this metaverse. But even if I, I am not like my parents, for them it's very difficult to understand. But for me, it's as well something that uh, we don't have books about that yet. Like we have a couple of them, but more into blockchain or NFT, like cryptocurrency, investing money, but not for artists. There is no any handbook handbook sorry for artists in order to understand or neither for galleries or art workers in order to uh, somehow know how to 
how to deal no with uh, with, with this new nft so it, i i think my contribution was more here for for learning about the other speakers as well to because i i had a lot of very nice inspirational comments about what they think about nft and uh again i think this record in the future for artists this uh, somehow continuing to get this uh, profit of what they have been doing and knowing where they are was are is uh, is crucial for them because now with the secondary market you resell a work i was uh, last week in a in an art fair here in madrid there is a emerging artist um, she born in 1993 and they are already selling secondary market stuff of her secondary market paintings and she is not getting anything out from that because it's already a secondary transaction so i was thinking about this uh, sort of communication in between the the art market and thinking that probably somehow this idea of uh, digitalization that you have more copies sometimes it will help the artist to avoid this secondary market that uh, collectors wants to have their works and they don't care and they buy in secondary market and they don't think that the artist is not getting any profit out from that. I think, Maria, you're adding, uh, again, a very, very important point uh, that Richard started and all of you started. I think it is what happens to those people, those artists that were before uh digitalization what what happens to them if they don't they don't know how to use digitalization because that's the problem here you know we uh, as you said i i also it's not only my mother i don't understand about metaverse and you know nfts is uh, again to what uh it's again very difficult to to perceive all of this and to digest it as you as you're all saying but what happens to those people, those artists that were there before? And to and but also again, now we're going to back to to Lisa, how to use NFTs in a very, a very important way, you know, to give a message to those artists that don't have a voice, that they can have a voice. Yeah. So that's you know, it's very it's it's a contradictory, but also at the same time, very, very I think very important here. So I, I I welcome Lisa before Maria because you have to go. You, would you like to say anything, or you can stay a little bit more? I can stay with the only with the uh, uh, audio. So if you I want will... to say any any anything else, because I think now we have uh, the other side of NFTs, how to use NFTs in in the in uh, for artists that are emergent, for instance. Yeah, I will any... keep hearing. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us tonight. So, Lisa, welcome. So, welcome back. As I said, you, you and so Richard much. are uh, a bit way with some of uh, the audience here. So, thank you again for being with us tonight from Nairobi. Uh, so, Lisa, again, I will introduce it to for who doesn't know Lisa Russell is MPH is an Asian American Emmy winning filmmaker and Academy Nichol screenwriting finalist who has been 20 years in the art world in the intersection of art, social justice, and sustainable development. So good evening, Lisa, how are you? I'm good, Carolina, nice to see you. Nice to see everybody. Um, I think what I wanted to start off with is just talking about sort of arts digitization as like a livelihood and survival because like I consider myself pretty techie. I've, I know how to program in Unity. I edit my own films. I'm, I'm on my computer a lot. But when COVID hit, you know, I lost like seven of my gigs in two days. Um, I work as a filmmaker primarily for the UN and I also curate artists. So my job involves traveling, for example, I have to go to different places to shoot my films. Um, and I, when I curate artists, I'm mostly live performing artists. So they're poets, musicians, beatboxer or whatnot. All of that came to a screeching halt. And I work in the gig economy, which means that when I lose these gigs, I don't have a full-time job. I don't have you know a savings i don't have a retirement plan or whatnot so it was really really scary and the thing that that allowed me to survive is that i was able to pivot pretty quickly into 
digitizing all of my work. So I was running a, a, an arts and film festival. I did everything online. I figured out how to do it all online. Um, I created with the World Health Organization a COVID-19 um, virtual art gallery. So I was able to transition. But the artists that I work with, both here in Kenya and East Africa, and also some of the young poets I work with in New York City, are not so technically advanced. Um, in fact, you know, it's been a real learning curve for me being here in Kenya, um, because so much of my work, whether it's like even these webinars or trainings or workshops, all went online. And you're talking to people who do have cell phones, so this is this is you know pretty good. And Mombasa, where I live, is pretty connected. But the reality is that buying bundles for internet is really expensive. Um, a lot of artists here do not have Wi-Fi in their homes. In fact, they'll come outside and sit outside my apartment and steal my Wi-Fi in order to have access. So when the world turned to Zoom, when the Western world turned to Zoom, the Kenyan and Tanzanian artists, I noticed all went to WhatsApp. And why? Because WhatsApp is bundled for free when you buy Safaricom minutes. And so I had to adjust my kind of Western global North way of working digitally and adapt to what it was that they were doing. Simultaneously, I didn't know how to, like I got asked by the UN Youth Envoys Office to curate a multi-artist performance with artists from four different countries. They still wanted to do something. Well, it's like, well, what can we actually do? Um, and so it was really fascinating where I got together six international youth artists from, from Indonesia, Kenya, Tanzania, and the States to create a poetry song and music video all remotely. And what I realized is that when we're empowering these artists who are not normally in the digital space to learn how to either adapt, or I think, which is more important to partner with digital artists, um, then we can wait until the tools catch up to make it easier for sort of the the non-techie artist. So for example, we're, I'm helping um, two Nairobi artists build an NFT collection. One is a graffiti artist. He does not work in the digital space at all. And I partnered him with a very well-established um, digital artist and together they are creating an NFT collection um, with support of UN Habitat. So, so there's ways to kind of maneuver it, but I wanted to um, just also like reflect, it's, it's just been a little bit weird that I, weirdly, um, because of the pandemic and because of everything being pushed into the digital space, filmmakers, videographers, editors actually have a lot more work now because everything is now digitized. So I still work with poets, but instead of curating them on a stage at the United Nations doing a live performance, I'll do a short, you know, creative video with them, for example. And if it's okay, I'd just love to show just like a quick um, part of the music video that we did with these artists. Um, Cause it was kind of on, it was a, a huge learning curve, but on the flip side, it was actually um, kind of a fun process. So if it's okay, Carolina, of can course, I just share like a few minutes of it? Yeah. Pleasure. Okay, so, so quickly, I'm just gonna tell the process cause I think it's fun. We had to come up with a song and, a, and music and so, we had a beatboxer, so we're like, okay, let's let the beatboxer lay down the beat. So she recorded a beat, she looped it. We then sent that beat to Indonesia. The musicians, who is a violinist, keyboardist, you know, they do much more of the band type stuff, added the, the melody. Then we sent it to LA for the first poet to write and perform. We had the chorus and the hook, and then we filled in sort of all the gaps. But this is tens of hours of work with people in opposite time zones and young people who are very busy putting together sort of a you know music video, poetry video around the very difficult theme that the UN wanted us to address, which was trust in institutions, which I laughed at. I was like, all the protests going on against police brutality and everything, and we have to write on trust in institutions. It was wild. But anyway, they did a really great job. So I just want to share just a few minutes mm -hmm. of it because it, it is Thanks. kind of fun. Of yeah. Um, wait a minute. I don't know if I let me share real quick. Okay, where is it? Oh, I think I accidentally closed the. Sorry. Um, no, don't worry. We are going through your that. emails. Yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Okay, so here we go. So this is it. I'm not going to play the whole thing. It's like five minutes long, but it was fun to make. We have learned the infrastructure of institutions and tried to put our faith in this factory. But the fact is, all things are flawed. But forgiveness must be achieved to allow our imagination to redesign what it is we want to see, what it is we want to build. A new structure that reflects the heart of every human, removing what is exclusive and we build what is inclusive. A reimagining of curriculum that colors from every spectrum makes the campus the kind of canvas I want to paint my genius into. As long as the transformation is genuine, the institution could become the guidance for a globe in need of a new collaboration. I'm listening. I'm listening. I do not know what happened. Um, I had to put our faith in this factory, like, but not. the fact is all things are flawed. But forgiveness must be achieved to allow a magic. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing because I think my Wi-Fi is unstable. But um, I can share the link to it. But but essentially, you know, teaching these poets and these musicians who do not normally have access to mm -hmm. a camera crew, a, you know, whatever, we had to quickly push them into the digital space. And what it made me realize is that we can overcome a large part of this sort of, um, you know, digital divide among artists or whatnot by focusing on partnerships. Like my my dream would be to create an artist residency here in Mombasa because it is on the coast of Kenya. It's beautiful. There's a lot of sustainable like development projects that could use the attention to bring artists from the global north who are here decked out with their laptops and everything and then combine them with sort of the analog young artists here to create content. Um, I think eventually the tools will catch up where we're not going to expect artists to learn how to program and code and design and shift completely into the digital space. Um, so I think it's also, you know, it's, it's a transition, but I just want to bring back that, you know, I have a master's in public health and my professor was a huge, huge, um, he, he's, he was the Dr. Fauci of the HIV AIDS world. He was the first um, AIDS pioneer at the UN. And he said something to me, which really came back in circle recently. He's like, you know, at any moment, there's a global pandemic, like bubbling beneath the surface. So yes, we're coming out of COVID, but that does not mean that we're not going to potentially face another, you know, situation. And if we are, it would be good to have some of these artists a little bit more well prepared so that the creative economy does not suffer so much. Um, if you know if things lock down again because it was a real struggle and and again for me I, I i have a you know pretty like stable career and i was floored um so a lot of the people who lost all of their work um it was it was difficult to see so um i think that's all i wanted to to say and to add but um i'm also jumping into the nft space um it's exciting and and i think in addition to the art, I think the utility is what is attracting me into what people are actually doing. If you check out some of the women-led NFT collections, it's incredible what they're doing. They're supporting, you know, building the first, you know, girls or building a school for girls' education in the metaverse. Um, there's people focused on climate. There's a lot of really, really fascinating stuff, I think, happening. So I'm excited to jump into it. So I think that's all I'll say for now. But um, thank you again for having me. <laughs> no, thank you, Lisa. I think you know this is a, what again Richard was uh, showing us. We are with the NFTs. With with what well, if we can educate uh, people, we can really use uh, these NFTs and embrace this world in in and create a better world because that that's that's what we should do. Uh, and I think uh, this is the most important thing is uh, to you know to embrace it, of course, because we cannot go back. And, and to use it in, in, in the best way we, we can. Um, I think what you do, Lisa, is wonderful. And that's why I wanted to you all to connect because uh, also Richard has, uh, has uh, some, some wonderful uh, background in Africa. <laughs> yes. So I think you could all, all create something beautiful. Uh, so I think Francois would like to say, I'm sure, something. <laughs> I can see him. 
<laughs> okay, then, uh, the pressure. No, I, it's actually really interesting because I'm hearing things tonight that I've been hearing and I didn't really react to them in the past. I don't know why. Like hearing, for example, royalties for artists. Um, and that kind of feels strange to me just because, you know, somebody who designs a car like a Ferrari doesn't get royalties, right? He designs the car and then he gets sold. Um, and so there, there's all these new concepts. So I understand the concept of royalty with music, right? So if, for example, somebody makes a work of art, it gets reproduced in commercials, advertising, etc. There, I totally understand royalties. Um, I, I get excited about NFTs. For example, when we talk about graffiti, Lisa, right? Um, who are we to decide that on a wall has less value than on a canvas, for example, right? So now the ability for somebody to do a tag, take a picture of it, NFT it, to be able to sell it as a work of art, I think is super exciting. Um, but I'm, I'm still, so what I'm struggling with, and I wish Shauna, um, whom Richard works with a lot, uh, was here tonight because at the end of last week's um, episode on digitalization and the metaverse, and heaven knows she's in the middle of it, right? She, she, she founded the, uh, the metaverse news network. And she was saying that she was struggling right now with where the metaverse was going, right? Um, it was actually creating an even more elitist world um, than the world we actually live in. Um, and I think she's very right when she says that. Um, you know, it was proven that if 1% in the real world owns about 70% of all resources, in the metaverse, it's 0.1% that owns 78%, right? Let's think about that. Here we are talking about decentralizing, democratizing, but in fact, we're making it a million times worse. Um, and so I, I think right now with NFTs, for example, the, what I'm struggling with is A, the fact that NFTs are considered a form of art, which they are not. They are a container, right? They are not a form of art. They, they can help authenticate, um, as Lisa would say, would say, right? They're able to record. They're able to, 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 to pass the test of time, if you will, right? Which is great. I appreciate that part of NFTs. Going back to what Richard was saying, great. The Ukrainian government is creating an NFT to raise funds for the war. But who stops a cartel to issue an NFT that somebody can pay $50 million for and all it is is money laundering, right? So I think there's still a correlation between um, crypto, between DeFi that needs to settle and that needs to be careered, for, for lack of a better word, before all of this can really take off, right? Um, you just need to look at the, the way things work. I was reading an article yesterday where Colorado actually announced that they were the first state to accept Bitcoin payments for taxes. How does that even work? So today I owe $40,000. It's a Bitcoin. Tomorrow Bitcoin is worth $10,000. Who exactly is going to pay for the deficit in taxes that we just kind of created and multiply that by 100,000 people? I th These are all the things that are all around this world that I'm still trying to comprehend. And I think there's so many pitfalls for abuse um, that actually worries me. I want to be excited about NFTs. I really do. And as I said, I am when it comes to, to, to capturing works of art in ways we haven't been able to do before and for artists to be able to sell their work who weren't able to do it before. Um, but aside from that, I'm just, I, I don't know. I struggle with NFTs. I struggle with the metaverse and I struggle with decentralization. Well, actually, I wanted to say something, even in response to what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, the impact of social media on young women and stuff like that. And I think as a society, we have to start, stop trying to control those messages, that culture, because it's going to exist no matter what we think about it. It's just, it's the way capitalism works. It's the way the world works. I think instead, I don't have children either, but if I did, I think my responsibility, instead of trying to keep them away from these tools would be to teach them, you know, in my world, media literacy. How can you be bombarded with these messages but still be solid 
in the way that you live your life and what you think about what you care about. And that I can relate to, I forget who you were mentioning, who says every night he asks his kids, da, 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 da. It's sort of like, you know, it is a responsibility for us to, you know, if, if, if you can't, if as an adult, you can't be self-reflective enough to know that your social media habits are harmful, that's, instead of cutting off the social media messaging, you, that, it starts with sort of you. And I think that sadly is the world that we live in. Like, I can't, I can't be afraid of information or be afraid of the NFT thing. What I need to do is know everything about it. Like really the reason why I got into the NFT space is because of the UN. They kept telling me they were having this digital art for climate contest and they wanted me to get the artist I work with involved in it. And I said to them, and literally it took four months. I'm like, I can't, I can't promote this. I can't do anything until I understand it. Right. And so then therefore I can be a more responsible curator. And so now I, you know, you can, I can talk all NFT stuff and I know the goods, the bads, what I need to be careful of, what I need to do, um, what, you know, what this is about. And I think that for me is my approach to the NFT stuff. Artists, this is, this is an, an opportunity for artists to monetize their work in a way that has never been done before. The collection culture is where I see people actually really making work. And it is a, you know, buy and flip, buy and flip collectors sort of thing. It's not really about the art. It's about the, the utility that's attached to it. It's about the, the marketing. It's about all of that. But the reality is if artists know how to play this game, it could actually create an opportunity for them to do so much more of the work that they want to do. Um, and so it has its good and it's bad, but I don't think, I, I think instead of trying to think, oh, should I embrace it or not? It's like, it's here it's here and it's gonna stay. So the best thing we could do for ourselves and for the young people I work with is just absorb as much as we can so that we can, we can make you know, credible decisions, we can make you know, informed decisions about how we wanna approach this space. You know, I'm struggling because it's like, you know, I work for the UN and my thing is on sustainable development. All, most of the NFTs are on OpenSea on Ethereum. Ethereum is horrible for the planet. So now I have the opportunity to use Polkadot on a unique network platform, but they don't have an audience. So if I don't make as much money on that platform as I could on Ethereum, then I'm not accomplishing the greater good that I want. So it's like there's some ethical things I'm still grappling with. And I just think, again, like, I forget who said it, but it's true. It's like, it's here and it's only going to grow. So it's maybe it's, we just need to embrace it and be more mindful of how we, of how we engage with it. So I'll, I'll go back to what Kristen was saying earlier, which was really interesting, which is we got lazy. Um, and we're kind of the, uh, the victim of our own stupidity and our own laziness. Um, combined with, you know, you're talking about children, as parents, it's actually incredibly difficult, right? Most parents now both need to work. You come home, you have to do homework. So it gets a lot more difficult to also be able to control um, social media. And even those social media platforms that were putting in parental control and limits actually lifted them, making it even more available because they saw that the numbers was go were going down. So they're like, oh, well, numbers are going down. Let's bring in the younger generation and let's bombard them. Um, but this is where I, I think that what is necessary, really, really necessary, is platforms such as what Kirsten is trying to build, where you know that it's, it's like watching PBS, right? You know that your kids are not going to be exposed to anything bad, right? Um, because even with parental controls on YouTube, right, <laughs> type the wrong word and you're still going to get content you don't want to see, right? Um, so I, I think that we actually need, and it's, it's, it's probably easier in very commas in the art world for art professionals to be directed towards a platform um, that is ethical and that is actually based on art, on a positive messaging, on giving true opportunities, and then growing that out of the art world into the real world versus doing what we're doing today, which is taking things like Instagram, Facebook, which are outside art world, and trying to push the art world into it. I'd love to see what happens when we do it the other way around. We take a platform that's art focused and grow it out to see what comes out of it versus the other way around. 
Well, I just want to add one quick thing on that. Um, so I work with incredible writers and poets, these young people. And I've always said, why are you putting all your work on Facebook? Like you're making money for Facebook. You're, you're not making any money, right? YouTube, same thing. The, the way that there's so much content now, you don't make a lot of money as a creator unless you have viral videos. So it's also training artists to realize, you know, social media is not always the best place to give away all your gifts. Maybe you, you use it, you write, you know, one part of a poem and then go to my website and then on your website, you're monetizing views or whatever. But we also need to shift to think, you know, these, these platforms, TikTok, everything, Instagram is, is inviting people to share all their creative content and they make the money. <laughs> we make no money off Instagram. There's not even an Instagram money-making mechanism that I'm aware of. So stop. We, we also need to train um, artists to stop giving away their content on social media. We're making them rich. Yep. That's and can I just say that collectors uh, have a responsibility there too, because I think that, you know, I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago and uh, an artist expressed a frustration over, he, it was a, a photographer who wanted to start um, creating NFTs of his work. So he was selling physical uh unique originals and wanted to then expand and monetize his practice in a different way. And he said, but I have like my biggest collector doesn't want me to do it because he doesn't want there to be a digital uh, version of my work out there. And I said, you know, that's a decision you have to make, but I don't like collectors getting into the driver's seat and dictating what they think creators should be doing because the myth that you know, starving artists want to continue to be starving is just such a myth. Like artists have a profession like the rest of us and they need to be able to live off of it. And if anything, a collector who is a responsible collector should be promoting and, and help supporting those decisions that artists are making of how to navigate forward and how to be able to stay in their practices, not cutting off the umbilical cord and saying that, you know, I'm not going to collect your work if I see that you're, um, proliferating in, in new channels because there's no way for a lot of artists to survive on such limited means. So I think um, it's just so short-sighted and exclusionary um, of collectors to try to like keep that you know, stronghold on the artists that they're collecting. It's just, uh, just a, strange, um, a strange attitude, I think, and something that we should all just take more responsibility for. It, it does become a supply and demand issue a little bit. And, and uh, by actually supporting artists, then you want to help them navigate the new technologies and, and, and create a sustainable practice that they can live off of, presumably, I think. Agree. I'd love to follow that up. Sorry, Francois, to follow no, that up, ahead, Christian, Richard. and say not not just is there a responsibility on the on the on the collectors, but I think platforms and galleries need to start thinking about this as well, because as an artist who's who was trying to get into galleries and who actually got into galleries in Manhattan, I can tell you right now that every artist feels abused by a gallery. Mm -hmm. yes. Every one of them. Because straight up 50% in order to get into those galleries, let's just talk the finances of what that looks like. In order to be in those galleries, I was paying 50% of gross to the gallery. So that means that I am losing 50% of the revenue, excluding my costs. So only I, I have to pay the gallery 50%. Then I have to pay how, whatever it is that my photos got produced. And I can tell you right now that a four, a 42 by 26 photo that I produce when it gets printed and, and mounted, that's $700. Mm -hmm. So if I've paid $700 for the photo to be produced and I've paid 50% of the gross to the gallery, what am I getting out of the deal? And what's even worse is then you get on, the gallery does one or two bits of promotion, but then they expect you to promote with your audience and grow your audience to promote your gallery show. So as an artist, I have, to, I have to then market myself, I have to market the gallery, and I lose 50% of my gross to the gallery. So what happened to galleries and platforms that then held, mentored, and advanced their artists to make it attractive for the advanced artist to get onto the gallery, rather than it being the other way around, what in order to, to make money, 
as an artist, you have to pay a gallery an exorbitant amount to walk home with peanuts. Wow. And, that... and, and what we're talking here is how do we support artists? Hmm. Right? That's, that's what yeah. this is all about, is how do we support artists, not galleries? Yes. And, and I'm going to, sorry, Carolina, I'm going to yes. take this a little step further because where we also need to start thinking about artists, what about artists that work in corporations? Mm -hmm. What about artists that create graphic work that goes up and makes corporations billions of dollars and you don't have a touch to? My contract with the cruise companies that I worked with said any picture that I took on board belonged to them. How do we start looking at not just how are artists being used, but how are creatives being protected inside of corporate structures? Because if we're thinking artists, right at the moment, this group is talking about artists who produce fine art for sale as prints or NFT. That's what we say when we say artist, correct? Can I, can I be a little bit controversial? Please, I love it that I'm not the only one that's right, controversial. I, uh, I'm really... I enjoy the conversation, but I want to be, I, yeah, I didn't want to say anything, but let me be very controversial. First of all, you say my contract with the gallery, my contract with Disney, et cetera, et cetera. You signed the contract. Mm -hmm. So it's your decision. The whole promise of web 3.0, NFTs, et cetera, et cetera, is that you as an artist take control of that all by yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the opportunity. I agree. And, uh, it's, me... and it's going to completely de-organize, um, unbundle, rebundle the mm -hmm. system. Galleries are going to continue to exist, but they're going to continue to exist differently. Galleries are going to pop up digitally, totally digitally. So there's going to be an enormous amount of, of things being unbundled, uncoupled, rebundled, recoupled. But you as an artist are be giving the tools to be an active player of that. And mm -hmm. NFTs and blockchain and all of that is giving you as an artist the opportunity. And this is where I think mm -hmm. the, the people who are talking about education here and are helping artists to understand that. Mm -hmm. I think that is the key message to most of the art, to all the artists, that mm -hmm. if you start to understand how you can do that, how you can use those technologies, and they're still early days. They, they're going to move mm -hmm. all over the place. But the idea of, of an artwork being sold on, if your artwork is on a blockchain with an NFT, every time it's being sold on, you will get a little piece of it. And we can learn from the music industry, because in the music industry, this is already happening. If a song is being played and you've bought it through iTunes, the artist will get a little bit of money. There's still arguments that Apple gets too much, but fine, it's, it's just the beginning. And the same is going to happen or will be, will be possible to happen with all these new technologies that today are Web 3.0, Metaverse, whatever, whatever you want to call it. But that's the, opportun that's the opportunity ahead of us. I agree with you totally. Let, let me just implicate and add on to that that I think every photographer in the world should go and work on a cruise ship because I got paid to practice. <laughs> you know I mean, yes, I lost all of, of course, those rights. Of course, you need to get your hands photos, dirty. Of course. But, but I got paid for 16 years to be a professional photographer. And now at the other side of that, I am now an artist that can handle whatever I need. But mm -hmm. I put in the time being paid by a company to do a percentage of the work. And that is still a pathway that artists need to look at of, of where can I use my art, not to just sell my direct art, but where can I use my art to be employed as an artist to learn and grow so that eventually I can output my own thing. These are all pathways okay. that we need to kind okay. of be explaining and, and they're not, to artists. And they're not dead ends. They're just no. ways to continue. And, and this new technology, is making it possible to, to expand. I, when I was a student, I was a photojournalist for a local newspaper. And as a, as a photographer, it's horrible to have to go mm -hmm. to the same, the same guy, the same politician, and to make, an, to make a photograph that's interesting. Because you think like, I would never voluntarily take a photograph of that politician. But you want to create something. So it's, it's a great learning platform. But at that time, my audience was a local town 
where I could go around and show some photographs. Mm -hmm. Today, my audience is the world. Mm -hmm. Because websites, Instagram, tagging, whatever you want to call it, the audience is the world. And I have the opportunity now to present my work to the world thanks to this technology. And, and, and the way you were describing that the artists are being held a little bit ransom or how you want to say, the, the artists are being controlled by galleries, by cruise ships, by whoever, by, by companies. I think mm -hmm. Web 3.0, the promise is that the artists are going to be much more able to own mm -hmm. their own work through, through these technologies. And I think that should be, if anything, artists should be helped to understand and to be taught is that this is the opportunity for you to exactly address what, what you just said. Can I just say one just thing there uh, that I think I totally agree with that. Uh, there's just one thing that I want to add is because we often talk as artists, as like artists as a group. And of course, every artist is an individual, just like the rest of us. And I think it's easy to generalize about what's good for artists or what's not good for artists. I know lots of artists who rely 100% on their gallerist, who would never mm -hmm. get rid of their gallerist under any circumstances, who don't want to answer their own well. emails, they're happy with it. And they're willing to, you know, take what that comes with it, which is a lack of autonomy, possibly making less money, because that's the comfort zone for them. And a lot of artists want to focus purely on their creation and don't want to manage anything. And I think that is also good to recognize. And that's also where the function of gallerists, I think, will always be important because there is a role there that many artists really need um, to have that person to carry them through different situations. And they don't want to lose the focus on their creativity. They want to just do their thing and have somebody else manage everything. So I think that A points out a really important role going forward with with um, gallerists or it could be a mentor or a rep or you know different roles but that role is super important um, and it's um, every artist does not want to just become totally autonomous and and mm -hmm. navigate that path on their own and even if it has a lot of financial benefits at the end of the day that you know it's it, it really comes down to the individual I, I agree and I think that's why I, I, I wanted to emphasize that I think this this new technology will, will unbundle and rebundle and regroup and we create, create these opportunities. But I don't think it will be, as you say, uh, totally get rid of galleries or totally get rid mm. of it. It will just add another opportunity there for people who want to grab it. It's the same as when, when the internet happened, the, the statement was newspapers are going to disappear, magazines are going to disappear, et cetera, et cetera. Look at it. There haven't been more, more magazines in the magazine shop than I've ever seen before. So there is opportunities uh, mm -hmm. for for all these different models to continue and to your point some artists would like to take that route and some artists would like to take another route but right now the artist who says i want to own it myself and i want to continue doing things myself web 3.0 nfts blockchain it gives them the tools it gives them the tools to say go ahead do it maybe even in collaboration with the gallery there's nothing wrong by saying i do some work myself and i work with the gallery who has the right audience who has a good deal with me who i trust who i like to work with I think all these I, I things think, are possible. And I think that's the opportunity that we, we have in front of us right now. Danny, I think, A, you, sorry, Carolina. I, Danny, I think you're, A, you're so right. And I'd like to add that, that not only are we seeing the, the galleries are getting involved, but also the other thing that's happening is you're starting to get these small little private agencies that are taking care of, of people coming into the NFT space that are prepared to collaborate with artists. And they have developers, marketing people with them that, that help the artists not just be a gallery, but to be able to, to use their own artistry and kind of act as, I think in the, in the movie industry, they have the agents, you know, all the actors have an agent. And it's nice to see something like agencies coming to support other forms of artist. And instead of it being a gallery, it's an agency that's helping individual artists grow their brand on a line and be able to not take that massive percentage that the gallery is, but take a smaller percentage of that transaction sale. And you're even starting to see agencies do it on equity, which is even more interesting because then artists are not paying up front for it. 
So uh, what you're saying about this reshuffling of how the industry works is we're starting to see it already with new developments of these new agencies. And a lot of them are so young, which is absolutely so fun to see where you're getting these little NFT agencies run by this group of 25 year olds and so on that are now supporting much older established artists to be able to do what they're doing. And I think the growth of that and the growth of collaboration inside of the space is incredible to see and how galleries and agencies and artists and platforms mix together and find how they all interact is part of what we're seeing at the moment. And it's fascinating. I agree with Danny a hundred percent. Yeah. And I think that cross pollination is something that sort of has stagnated in the art world where it's been like a very sort of structured hierarchical way of looking at things that people have been so used to. And that's where I think the laziness has come in. But when you have this like new innovation and that has in part to do with the technologies and then in part to do with the mindset of people who are immersed and, and, and tech savvy in this space, mm -hmm. it's like new thought comes to how these cross pollinations can take place. And then all of a sudden an artist becomes, you know, matched up with another artist who's working in a different way and together what they're creating becomes like a whole new medium. So I think that is also um, both increasing the autonomy of artists, but also increasing the community um, amongst artists and the people who can sort of manage that and bring those people together. And that's such a gift for creators to be connected with other creators who can help them grow their practice together and, and that evolution. And um, it's not just about maintaining, but actually, and sustaining, but actually evolving your practice and giving artists the tools to actually and become a better version of themselves and learn new things and to constantly evolve rather than just being sort of happy and stable in a place and knowing that they can survive you know it's about like how they can continue to reinvent themselves if they choose to and they may choose to or they may not but having those new opportunities brought to them or or just raising a consciousness about what the possibilities are um is fantastic i think thank you kirsten and thank you danny uh, I, I would like to hear uh, from David. And uh, yes, what, what do you think, uh, David? You being an art collector of uh, not emergent artists. <laughs> so <laughs> no. what do you think well, about all of it? All I can reflect on for me is that all this innovation is happening sort of real time amidst with all of us talking about it. I think in previous generations, like with, I was a musician when uh, digital, when music went digital mm -hmm. um, and we had to adjust to what it was like to record digitally as opposed to analog and et cetera. And, um, you know, that stuff kind of happened behind closed doors, if you will, like in the industry. Um, and as artists, we just were responding to what was happening, but, but we weren't engaging in, in the change with the people that were doing the thinking. Do you know what I mean? And, and today, it's, since it's all kind of happening online and in, in the public sphere, we're all talking about it at the same time. And it's, it's, it's hard to manage as people. It's, I mean, for me personally, it's because it, it really gets back to kind of um, personal responsibility and morality, and how do we interact as people and all the big issues about life come up when we're talking about this stuff. So, you know, that's all I have to say. I, I love listening and learning at these conversations. That's mostly what I do. Thank you, David. Oh, I, I, <laughs> it's very important because as I said, if you're not tech technological as a, uh, as me, I can say it is, you know, you are lost in translation. I know, Francois, I always uh, paraphrase this title of this movie, which I love, but it is, it is, we are completely lost. And for some artists, it's, it's still very, very, you know, also for the culture where we live, because there are some, some cultures that are very close minded to technology. Mm. And, and to the Northern we, we go, as I said to Kirsten, 
the more technological they are. So it's uh, also a way of, of living that we have to, um, we have to adapt. So it's, it's very interesting. But mm -hmm. thank you, thank you all. Uh, and from Oliver, that has been with us until, until now, would you like to add anything? Well, um, it's been absolutely fascinating. I really appreciated hearing everyone's viewpoints. Um, Kirsten, I'm uh, really fascinated by just about everything you've had to say this evening. Wonderful. Um, maybe just to mention, there are lots of parallels of the project we're doing. Um, we are uh, approaching galleries and artists. A lot of the conversation around the galleries and role of galleries and artists has been very interesting. But we're approaching galleries and artists to create digital editions of what we call used called analog, but we call tangible art um, as uh, as NFTs, and we do see that as a I think you know the, the points people were raising about uh, empowering and providing an, uh, in this alternative income stream through royalties, but also helping young artists transition into full time art production. I think that's also a really important point. Um, so you know th there is a point uh, where you know a lot of artists start out maybe being I don't know, a web designer or it might be an animator of some kind. And then that point at which they cross over into full-time art production is not easy. So, you know, creating income stream to those young artists, I think is really important. I think NFTs provides a vehicle for that. Um, so, um, yeah, no, I, I, I've been fascinated listening to, to, to all of, of everyone's conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. So please do, do share all your websites and links that we could uh, you know we could uh, reach you that it's a uh, it's a uh, fantastic as as richard mentioned we we're kind of we're back in a sort of a, a market research phase we were going very hard for a launch in april about two or three months ago and uh, with the market correction and then with the war and the instability that's been brought to the, the market we're we're going back to market research, which has just been, I mean, it's fantastic. <laughs> I couldn't be happier. Not about the war, I must say, needless to say, it's all very, very stressful. But, you know, the going, being able to go back to researching the product and making sure that we take into account the needs of artists and take into account the needs of, uh, of galleries as well. You know, we think that they're a very valid part of the, um, the art world and they, they do inform as much as, you know, there is issues around um, uh, the money that they take, that they do, they do form an important part of the art world. So, yeah, it's just been very important that we think we're going back to that point where we're, we're understanding and making sure the product is right for the market. And please, guys, go to the arttalk.com. On there, you can post, um, and it stays for a lot longer. It, it reaches our nearly 1,000 members. So please post on there because you will get some feedback. And Oliver, I know that the girls at the uh, Art and Tech Report are about to release a report on NFTs specifically, which I think will great, give great insights also from the collector point of view. Um, because again, and addressing what Kirsten was saying, I, I think what the biggest problem with the art world is how fragmented it is and why it's so difficult to get everybody onto one platform. I mean, there are five new ones every single day, and it's so frustrating because everybody's doing the same thing. They're just approaching their small network of galleries or their small networks of artists and their small network of collectors, and that's why it's so fragmented. Um, but I was also presented with a company last week that I'm talking to next week that is working on a solution to aggregate everything under one roof. And I think once we start doing that, then we start getting traction because now everybody gets involved versus little ones that just don't seem to be able to come through. So I, I'm very excited about that. I have a very interesting question for you on this one, Francois. What, what, what do you see the difference between fragmented and decentralized? So fragment, uh, decentralized in the, in the um, actual way it's used today in mm -hmm. terms of taking away the power from the power, if you will, and distributing it more democratically, right? We're talking, mm -hmm. we're talking about DAOs and stuff like that. Fragmented for me is the market, right? Where Oliver was saying they're working on something that's parallel to what Kirsten is doing. Um, today, I was talking to somebody who's building something that's similar to what Kirsten is doing, but a little differently. And I've been approached by several companies doing that, um, several companies doing NFT minting, several companies reaching out to for royalties. And so 
I, I think that it's great that there are all these endeavors, but they should all come under one roof because that's how you get traction, right? Um, and I think that to what Kirsten was saying, which is very true, I think collectors are the ones who can drive this. Um, in fact, I need to talk to you about this afterwards, Carolina, because I have an idea about that. Um, but I think because collectors are the ones who are bringing out the artists, if we're gonna remove or kind of change the role of the middleman, I think creating a platform that's a, well, and it's burning me as I'm saying it, um, Instagram, but for the art world, by the art world, for artists, I think that's when we're going to see a real change and when we can see something that's going to be a lot more positive with a lot more positive messaging, a lot more positive for the artists and for the industry in general. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Thank you all. I think, you know, it's a, it's a, we could be hours, uh, you know, speaking about, um, this topic and i thank you all from everywhere you are in the art world so it is really <laughs> wonderful and i hope danny you you had an amazing talk can can i have your feedback now <laughs> sorry go ahead I was like, no, no, no. did you enjoy this uh, this talk yes i did okay once i got over art it, i thought last time was very good this was very good yes the thing about I, the only comment I wanted to give was about decentralized. I was looking it up. When the for me this is a normal trend. This is normal. When the when the car industry started in the U.S. Today we know Ford and Toyota and whatever. When the car industry started in the U.S., there were 500 car manufacturers. This is this is going to continue. Yes, I, I get I, I get I think once a week I get a proposal from someone. I'm I'm an investor. I get a proposal from someone who's going to build some kind of online digital art platform. It's just, no. it's we are, we are, but as I said, you know, last, last, uh, just last enjoy time. it. Yes. No, no, but you're right. You know, that's why, you know, I invited last, last week, really, um, Nane Dekin, who was one of, you know, the first mm. guru to think about, you know, blockchain and bringing art to, you know, to, to, uh, to all of this that we're talking today. But it's also important, you know, to understand also how how it has to be simple. You know, it's mm -hmm. we are uh, we are so many platforms, so many artists. They reach out, and which one would do you advise us? There are so many, and uh, whatever since, you feel like, go with the flow. I think and it's going to change. Like... And the only thing is, it's going to change. The one you choose now, in five years from now, it won't work. It it things will move on. But don't you think also that when the dust settles a little bit, you know, there's going to be a graveyard of NFTs out there that, you know, 99% of, of all that content is going to disappear. Of and course. then there's also going to be a graveyard of platforms and initiatives because the people who are just in it for the kill and the highly speculative, you know, quick in, quick out, who are not thinking long term in terms of a mindful, sustainable progress. And, you know, that's going to be a very quick death. And then hopefully in a couple of years time, when things settle, it's going to be, you know, the people who are thinking long term and in terms of like baby steps and really just listening to the market and, and making responsible choices and are not just in it for like a quick buck. Hopefully that, that will result in something really meaningful and, uh, and positive that's benefiting the artists and, and the market. We'll I'm okay with the fact that it's gonna be a graveyard. I, I mean, uh, David talked about the music industry. I can't remember, who was the, what was the first platform where people started to put their own music and their own websites on? Uh, I forgot the name. MySpace? No, before my, yeah, maybe it was MySpace. Now it's MySquare. It could have been Napster. Yeah. Oh, Napster. yeah. I think Napster. Napster through the cats I, among the pigeons. I, th I think the dust is not, it's, it's going to continue, but I think the dust is never going to settle because the technology is going to continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what do you think about worldwide acceptance, Danny? I mean, I, I love watching this stuff grow and, and I love seeing what Lisa's doing in Africa to, to grow into mm. places where I have energy problems and see how mm. they're getting around it. To me, what Lisa's doing in Nairobi and in Kenya mm. is, is absolutely groundbreaking. Um, because working in those places where, where even energy development is a problem. I mean, Tanzania and the outskirts of Tanzania, there's nothing there. There's nothing. 
so so what she's doing out there to bring this kind of stuff into the lower end of the market i think is revolutionary lisa i'm such a fan of what you're doing thank you it's fantastic and uh, no i i think all of you are doing something extraordinary so i really thank you you know for bringing this uh, this uh, your your you know your inspiration to the art world so thank you again and uh, i hope you will join me again and lisa <laughs> next friday i'm sorry for you we have a friday women's day which we haven't celebrated yesterday because women have to have to celebrate it every day but no especially artists uh, we are going to talk about women artists how they uh, you know they're still uh, what are the challenges in 2022 even though you know we have a uh, a war coming and I will have uh, some artists from Ukrainian actually very soon uh, to talk about this with the big comic art. Thank you also for all the things you're doing. So again, thank you all for being almost two hours again with us. So, and have a wonderful day, evening and morning.